Well, it was during the oil embargo of the United States. It alarmed me that a little country over in the, in the Far East could actually cripple the United States. And realizing that the entire industrial base of the United States and, and the world is based on the supply and the utilization of energy, it became imperative that we must try to bring in an alternate fuel source and do it very quickly. Of course, I thought originally with the right type of funding, uh, we could possibly get it in within six months. But uh, reality shows that the, the 12 to 15 years was more uh, correct in this projection. Back in the 70s, Stan Maher set out single-handedly to solve America's energy problems. He decided to do it using water, the world's most abundant storehouse of hydrogen, which is a far more powerful fuel than oil. For 15 years, Maher has been fighting to get his inventions taken seriously. Most inventors uh, have to be a loner. You have to be somewhat thick-skinned and don't rely on other people to support you, because they will not. More times than not, uh, an invention is really stolen from the inventors. Even in my prior development of high technology, I've had uh, patents uh, taken from me. I learned from the School of Hard Knocks to be very cautious. Ma has always stood out against the crowd. He has no formal qualifications as a scientist because he didn't wait to graduate from high school, leaving early to go straight into research at the high-powered Battelle Institute in his native Ohio. Now he works full-time as a private inventor. He's built a device with potentially revolutionary implications. There is nothing startling about a machine that can extract the hydrogen from water. What is highly unusual is that it should do so with ordinary tap water. The conventional method is called electrolysis. Meyer has turned that process on its head. Unlike electrolysis, his device doesn't use up large amounts of electric current, nor does it produce an enormous amount of waste heat. For 20 years, he has been refining a method to fracture water, which produces vast amounts of hydrogen on demand. This is not his latest apparatus. He was unwilling to let us point a camera at that. This is the simple device he used to convince a reluctant patent office that his revolutionary concept actually works. Alloy rods, acting as electrodes, are housed in a perspex container that's filled with water. Normal mains voltage is fed in through a transformer, but critically, there is virtually no current consumed, less than half an amp. The result is dramatic. Hydrogen pours off with the flick of a switch. Meyer claims the key is his electronics, which pulses electricity rapidly across the rods at up to 20,000 cycles per second. In a way that's not readily apparent, this process transforms the equation. Whereas in conventional electrolysis, three times as much energy is consumed as is produced in the form of hydrogen fuel, in Mars apparatus, the reverse is true. It appears to produce several hundred percent more energy than it consumes. Stan has something that's characteristic of the people that sound like they've done something to tap zero-point energy. Uh, has high frequency, high voltage, and there's a combination of the two at which something occurs. Uh, with Chenetsky in Russia, it was what he called a self-sustaining discharge. The tube would run by itself. When Stan gets this effect, the amount of hydrogen and oxygen that are, are emitted off these two electrodes is a step function. It almost boils the water. If I did this with standard electrochemicals, I need current and the water should rise a degree every couple of seconds. With stands, it'll run for a half hour, and, you, and the water temperature hasn't changed. Something's different. Meyer demonstrates this repeatedly without any difficulty, and yet on the face of it, it represents an extraordinary revolution. His measurements over the years suggest 1,700% greater efficiency than conventional electrolysis. And if he's to be believed, he's getting much better results from his latest, still secret invention. Well, I first got involved with Stan Mai when I went over there with a couple of colleagues to, to look at his water splitting device. And so we arrived at Stanley Mayer, he had a demonstration cell, we filled it with tap water, in fact I did that myself, and he switched it on and almost instantly there were three jaws dropped because of the, the, the rate at which the gas poured off. It was quite spectacular. Whatever energy source Stan Meyer had tapped, 
it was not explicable by the electric power that was going into it. So something was powering it outside of conventional wisdom. There is no question that the gas coming off in such abundance is hydrogen. Meyer ignites it to produce a high temperature flame able to cut through metal. Stanley Mayer has faced a lot of difficulties. Uh, he's three times tried to launch the device and produce press conferences, had the technical press round, but he's been almost universally slated. In the early days, very much so, they just ridiculed the whole idea. He's getting a little more notice now because some scientists are getting interested. But by and large, science is very intolerant, particularly modern science. As with Tesla, Griggs and others, Meyer's claims are so far outside the received scientific wisdom that they've been ignored by the majority of the scientific establishment. But then, Meyer has ignored them too. He has poured his energies over the last ten years into establishing recognition for his claims by getting international patents. In the processing, there was a great deal of difficulty in trying to process uh, the legal paperwork in such a way as to allow the patent office to fully understand uh, what was actually occurring. In one instant, uh, we brought the water fuel cell uh, to Washington, D.C., and of course I had tweaked it in such a way to produce an enormous amount of hydrogen and oxygen gas, and the patent examiner said, no, it will not work uh, based on the electrolysis process. And uh, when we turned it on and produced an enormous amount of hydrogen and gas, uh, the examiner finally realized that we were doing exactly that and uh, went out in the hallway and started screaming and hollering to everybody on the floor, put out all your cigarettes, hydrogen's hydrogen in the building. So we started laughing and said, well, we certainly convinced everybody in the patent office that we can do what we said we can do. Even so, the U.S. Patent Office dragged their feet for three years before granting patents on the hydrogen-producing device. Since then, against massive resistance, he's managed to get patents established throughout Europe and Japan. But the hydrogen machine was only the first step towards Mars' ultimate dream. If he gets it right, this application of his technology would change the 21st century in the same way that the Wright brothers and Carl Benz transformed the 20th. He is currently modifying a beach buggy to run on nothing but water. It doesn't have a petrol tank or even a hydrogen container. It has just a tank of water. He's invented a device called a water splitter to replace the spark plug. As the water is injected into the engine, Meyer claims it's fractured into hydrogen and oxygen and then burned as fuel. Meyer is working on a kit to modify any engine. He hopes to demonstrate it on this car within 12 months. And of course the blessing to the use of the water as a fuel source uh, that on combustion the byproduct is water mist. So we're even solving the environmental pollution problem at the same time that we're using water to maintain the industrial basis of the world. Maher is protective about his inventions to the point of self-confessed paranoia. Most observers describe him as a crank and his car as an aberration. But then madness and genius often go hand in hand. Ma shares with many inventors a problem that goes well beyond paranoia. As an engineer with no scientific background, he faces a giant hurdle when he tries to communicate with scientists. One problem is that the language that people use when they're trying to describe their inventions is not the language that I as a scientist am used to, and so I have to translate it, if you like, into a way that I can begin to understand what they're trying to say. It might as well be written in Swahili for all of the sense that it initially makes. And so I'm not particularly inspired to put a lot more effort in in the hope that the pearl of wisdom will reveal itself to me. At a certain point, you hit a law of diminishing returns. It isn't just a question of the difficulties of communication. There is a profound barrier between scientists and inventors and a strong reluctance on the part of most scientists to risk their reputations grappling with issues that don't have a clear scientific pedigree. Reluctance to look foolish inhibits a lot of people from looking at things. This is looked at as a pariah. You get, you touch it and it, it creates an image of you that you don't want your colleagues to see. One extreme, you might have things that are guaranteed to work, but are not very interesting if they do. And at the other extreme, things that are a real long shot, but would be revolutionary. And so you have to try and 
weigh the balance and decide which side is more likely to be profitable for you. Then having made some choices, you then have to ask yourself, how do I actually go about doing this? Do I have to apply for funds to do it? And if I do, who will I be competing with? And what is the better chance that this will be supported or that? Because at least in the big science area that I work, you can't just sort of come up with an idea on a Friday and expect to start the experiment on a Saturday. It takes many months, many years even, of preparation. But though the scientific establishment may have ignored the likes of Meyer, the powerful military industrial complex certainly hasn't. Over the past 10 years, Meyer says he's been quietly approached by many influential organizations who would never admit publicly to their involvement with him. It is involved in deep space exploration and it's also uh, being developed uh, quite highly in the military. Basically what occurred with water fuel cell was in the fact that once they understood uh, was actually occurring, then under the U.S. national security uh, mandate, uh, I have no decision or power of whether or not the military or NASA or the federal government will utilize the technology. They can utilize it in any way they so desire. NASA is using every method it can to regain some of its now fading glory. In the face of strong congressional resistance, the days of limitless budgets for space exploration have long since gone. As the champion of a new, environmentally friendly energy source, NASA would gain immense support. Your identification, please. You have your identification? As a former top scientist of the NASA space plane project, Professor Paul Ziss has an inside track on the workings of the agency. NASA has large centers. The center that's in charge of propulsion is NASA Lewis in Cleveland, Ohio. Can you imagine, instead of having a, um, a million pound rocket has 900,000 pounds of fuel on board, an oxidizer, can you imagine what it would be like if you could put a device on there that would split water and run it into your engines? No explosive compounds. Public confirmation of a contract from NASA would provide a resounding boost for Mars technology. But Paul Ziss says it's only in a closed meeting they confirm such an agreement. They're looking for new energy sources. I understand from the people that I've talked with that they have worked with Stan and trying to understand what he's done and given him a contract. I also understand with the bureaucracy in Washington and the con congressional oversight as to why they would never admit it. Anyone that does that will be suspect, will be challenged, will be considered a threat. But if only a fraction of what Meyer claims for his technology can be achieved, it would represent a vindication for NASA's involvement. It would also be a powerful threat to many entrenched vested interests. If Stan Meyer's device works like he advertises, you would make energy available universally almost free. That is a major, major, major impact. When new technology comes in existence, there's a great uh, resistance to it uh, because it can affect a lot of economic factors. Uh, in this particular case in the United States, um, we pay out roughly about $200 billion a year for foreign oil. Uh, it's quite obvious that uh, the Arabs would pay $200 billion to try to keep this type of technology uh, out of the economy. And many, many times over the last decade, uh, I have been offered enormous amounts of money to simply sell out or to sit on it. The Arabs offer me well over a billion dollars cold cash simply to sit on and do absolutely nothing with it. My life has been uh, threatened uh, many times. Uh, of course, I happen to believe in the power of angels. And if I don't believe in the power of angels, I don't believe I'll be around here too long. If the thing like Stan Mayer has works, every piston engine, every gas turbine in the world today, if it had his converter, could run on it. Uh, with a little invention, we could get standalone devices to run all over the world. Um, I think it would be, inc what I would can be concerned about is the people that sell energy would be essentially bankrupted. It's what happened to the Conestoga wagons when trains came, or to the Pony Express when the Telegraph came in. They're going to wipe out 
an entrenched power base, and they may not go easily.